Are you tired, frustrated, and feel stuck? Are you a high-performing business professional, entrepreneur, and you are not getting the results you desire or you hit a ceiling? Have you been around the block and tried many modalities? You are in the right place. The answer, my friend, is in the little-known brain-soul connection. Welcome to the Brain Soul Success Show, where we learn, explore, and create your dream life. Your host, Louise Schwartz-Walter, created a five-part mind-body-soul methodology that clears the subconscious blocks to success. You are a soul with a body, not a body with a soul. The seed of all you need is already within you. From engaging transformational interviews, brain soul success stories, and secrets shared by health, wellness, and spiritual experts, you will reconnect, revitalize, and transform your powerful life. It's time for you. Welcome back, everybody, to the Brain Soul Success Show, and you're in for a real treat today. With me today is Trent McIntyre. He's been helping people gain back their mobility, and wait till you hear his story. So talk about turning lemons into lemonade. This is your guy. Um, he was born with cerebral palsy and experienced a lot of pain and stiffness every day from the time that he was a child. And he's now discovered these methods that help people get back their mobility. Um, he received um, you know, university degree in dance requiring in-depth movement. It's like a science and training. He did Feldenkrais and Laban. Is it Laban or Laban? How do you say that? Laban. Laban. Laban yep. movement analysis. Um, and then what's the next name here? Bartonet? Uh, Bartoniev. I know it's a, it's a. I would not get that one. Thank you for that. That's right. <laughs> Bartoniev fundamentals. You're going to explain this to us. I hope you're sure, um, sure. kinesiology and anatomy. Uh, and you know, he's just got a, you know, awards out the wazoo here. So he was a presidential scholar while attending Western Michigan university in 2015 and 16. He was named distinguished alumni for his innovations um, and then he started a professional dancer career, performed on stages, and then he continued to really learn and leverage these methods. And here he is, you know, 20, 25 years later, his transformational methods and tools have changed thousands of lives, you know, who he's working with seniors and kids and people with MS and cerebral palsy and Parkinson's. And he figured out some secrets about how it's connected to the brain and the neurological system. He's worked with athletes. Um, and I know your mission now, right, is to deliver these methods and tools to everyone you possibly can who have any kind of related limitation. You've just done stellar, stellar work. Um, so welcome. I'm so, I'm so delighted to be with you today. Thanks for having me, Louisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's really, really, really awesome. So tell us, I mean, I know that you were born with a mild form of cerebral palsy. You certainly you know, have overcome a lot of this, you know, how did you do it? Well, I'll tell you, I have to say, it, you know, it's a funny slash not so funny story of even how I knew and learned that I had cerebral palsy. So um, I didn't know growing up that there was anything quote unquote wrong or different about how I felt or moved. Mm -hmm. And I was always athletic. I played basketball. It's my favorite sport. I was on my bike all the time. And so I just felt the way I felt. I didn't know that I could have felt better. I just know I felt uncomfortable most of the time. And, uh, you know, getting into dance became this therapeutic, um, you know, amazing experience where the stretching and the strengthening part of dancing made me feel better. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of my purpose of following that was I just helped my body feel better. I just, for the first time in my life, it's like, man, I feel more comfortable in my body. And then I enjoyed being on stage and I enjoyed the creative process and I enjoyed the athleticism of, of dancing. And so I, you know, came from a very small town and got a scholarship to go to college and went and majored in dance because that was like my ticket out, right? Uh -huh. And a way to get a higher education. And while I was in college, we were doing some incredible work. I had a lot of performances in one week. And then I woke up and I could barely walk to the shower. And I had so much pain and inflammation from the knees down that I thought, I don't know if I can continue doing this because this feels 
completely debilitating. Like this is like career ending kind of a feeling. Mm-hmm. And it just it, my break, I had a break that kind of correlated in the time frame, and I was home just kind of telling my mom and kind of complaining about all the pain and not, like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why from the knees down and, you know, what, what's going on that that's where it hurts so much. It just, it's really unbearable. I don't get it. And then she looked at me and she's like, well, Trent, that's because you were born with cerebral palsy. And I was like, wait, what? And I was, you know, 19, 20 at the time. And wow. I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, yeah, I don't remember when you were three, the doctors cast you flat because your heels wouldn't go on the, on the ground. So you'd learn to walk on the balls of your feet. And so they cast your heels down to give you that range of motion. And suddenly I had this memory flashback of, yeah, I remember like having two casts on my legs from the mm-hmm. knees down and it was in the winter and they had to put garbage bags on my legs so I could go in the snow and like the whole bit came so like rushing back to me. And it was like, wow. So this whole time I'd felt this way growing up, I had no idea that there was a really good reason behind it. And of course, mm-hmm. at that time, you know, they did the therapy, the casting my heels flat and it was over. There was no therapies. There's no follow-up. There's no discussion in the family about what was going on. So it just sort of like it was over until it showed up that my limitations when put to an extreme test created repetitive injuries, repetitive stress injuries wow. in the body. Mm-hmm. And that was the start of me problem solving and building what has now become a 25 year career. Wow. I love that. So you turn again, turn lemons into lemonade you know, you definitely struggled. You know, I always find that people create things from their struggles. You know, we have to sort of go through something to kind of come up on the other side, Yeah. you know, so kudos for you for asking good questions and and finding it out. But you're right in those times, they didn't really express what had happened to you when you were little. Yeah. And it was really, it wasn't until, you know, years later that I got really curious about, um, looking into some really good research to better explain what's going on. And I just feel like to this day, I feel like calling it cerebral palsy is just the wrong name because people don't understand that it was a brain injury. And, Mm -hmm. and when you say that to people, they don't know what you're talking about. Really. They know kind of when they see somebody with like a, a more severe variety of it, maybe Mm -hmm. they have a walker, they're in a wheelchair, they have a marked gait that's so obvious, but for me and many other people that are class one or class two, you may not notice when you're looking at them. And so nobody looked at me and made me feel like I was walking weird or doing anything unusual Mm -hmm. growing up. But the truth is, is I had severe limitation. And so, you know, while it's not degenerative and I'm not suffering more now because of it, but there was a period of time where I didn't have range of motion. So I learned how to move my body without having my brain mapping (laughs) that movement. And so recovering my own movement patterns and tapping into the neurological process to do that you know, it was for me first. And then I started Mm -hmm. to share with other people and then getting clients and sort of expanding it from there. So, so it is a brain injury. Do you know in like what part of the brain or is it the same for everybody? Cause I love the brain. I mean, I would love to like dissect a brain or, or like even like literally dissect your brain, (laughs) like, like, like see it. So can you describe anything about that to us? Yeah, it's, it's not, it's never the same for two people. And by no means am I the the cerebral palsy physician expert. I'm sure there's people that have spent their career just studying that element of it, but Mm -hmm. very clearly I've experienced so much and I've done a lot of research and studying to to say that I know that, um, you know, you you have a brain injury, it could be in any part Mm -hmm. of the brain. Mm -hmm. And that part of the brain is in charge of speech. It's in charge of this movement. It's in charge of this thought process. It's in charge Mm -hmm. of this quality. And so for the period that you are really should be developing those skills, that part of your brain is injured. So you don't Mm -hmm. develop those skills. Well, the brain heals and you move on, but you didn't develop those skills. So now, you know, you have less range of motion. You don't lift your arms as high. You can't take a biggest step. You can't put your heels down, you know, because you didn't, you didn't have that skill because you had a brain injury in that part of your brain that was affecting, you know, this and that. And Um, it was congenital though, right? You were born with it. Yeah, it was, it, it is, it is um, thought to be the speed of my birth. It was a traumatic birth. So it was, it. it was like suffering mm-hmm. a head injury at birth because of the speed at which I was born. This is what oh, I, gosh. What oh man, I really want to work on this. This is really, this is really cool. You know, cause I release traumas in the brain mm-hmm. and I don't know hypothetically until I start, you know, really diving in with you, but I don't know 
if I can release those traumas in the brain and if it would have made a difference even 20 years ago. I believe yeah. I can because traumatic yeah. brain injury I've worked with in three months, they're, they're better. Sure. You know, and sure. it's because it's multidimensional, multisensory. But when we've had something even from birth, like you said, you were born too fast and the brain's miraculous, it will heal, you know, oh, yeah. and, or another piece of the brain will take over. You know, but it makes exactly. sense that it's brain related because it's the nervous system yeah. giving the messages to your muscles, to your body, to your joints, to, yes. you know, to make those movements. And like you said, it's about brain mapping. You know, yeah. if we've learned something, if you learn how to ride a bike, you never forget because your body knows how to do that. It's learned yeah. that the brain has the processes down. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's where, you know, for me, understanding that that's the key. The brain is processing the information that it takes in from its surroundings yep. became the key to how I could help other people in a much easier and simpler way, because mm -hmm. I can certainly have, you know, a facility with equipment and work one-on-one -on -one and, and create some pretty profound results. But, you know, how could I help people get this, get this into their hands and make it easy and simple and help them understand how powerful the brain is and how easy it is to give the brain better information because that's what it comes down to it's giving your eyes and your inner mm -hmm. ear better information so that you can have better quality of movement and so how do you do that describe describe how you would work with somebody who needs that help yeah so so i, I want to i always want to know what what's at stake for somebody so let's talk about you know wh where we go in a session or where i would suggest someone goes is really what's at stake Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier that I work with kids and athletes and those with Parkinson's and MS, and they'll have very different goals. So, mm -hmm. but here's the thing, they all have eyes, they'll have inner ear, they'll have <laughs> the key sensory input. And so while their goal and what's at stake is different, um, it gives us a goalpost to know that we are like are being successful. And I want to have, I want to be able to measure success that's based on your need. So, you know, for kids, maybe they want to be able to sit and focus Maybe they want to be able to concentrate during homework or they need regulation support. And mm -hmm. certainly when you give the eyes and inner ear, especially the eyes, better information, you have better regulation and better stress management. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to, I, what I did is I developed a really simple game of catch. Um, I developed, okay. a, I even developed, developed a product around it because I wanted to get something in someone's hands. Now I know this is audio and visual because it's visual though. I will grab just to show the people that are watching the video. Okay. Um, but this is the brain speed ball. And this is something that I developed out of the need to be able to help pattern and track your visual system. Visual. Because okay. when, when you look at how the brain takes in information, we know the brain takes in information through the sensory system. It also mm -hmm. prioritizes the information that comes from the eyes. So if we can give the eyes the same kind of attention we would muscles and joints in that, we wanna make them stronger, have more mobility, make them more coordinated. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they can take in better information because better input equals better output. So, you know, for someone who has a movement disorder, we can get better movement because we're getting better input. And so the game of catch, it works like this. If Louise, if you and I are playing a game of catch and I throw this okay. to you, you would okay. first like catch the ball mm -hmm. and I would just ask you to track the orange ball coming into your hands. Okay, just to make sure that you can catch the ball first. And then I'm gonna say, next time you catch it, tell me what you see on the ball. So we have A through Z and one through 12 printed on the ball. And then by tracking it into your hands, and then and that will then say, tell me what you see. So you say it out loud. And what happens is by catching it, seeing it and saying it out loud, you complete a brain processing cycle. So you're sensing what's wow. going on. Yes. You're deciding what to do about it. And then yes. you're acting on it. Yes, then, you're doing it. It's multi-sensory. It's multi-dimensional. Yeah. I get it because right. my right. system's similar, but this is very, it's different, but I get the multi-dimensional sure. concept sure. of sure. that for sure. And playing catch is just a great, you know, because it's eye body. It's, it's the eye hand coordination. Exactly. Yeah. So going yeah. back to your question about like, how do you start with somebody a playing, a playing game of catch that tells okay. me really where they can track because when they start to drop the ball, you can see, oh, with the eyes have a harder time tracking or have a less range of motion to a certain side or certain direction, you know? And Got then when, when you start to be able to track and say what you see in the ball more easily, we can make the game a little more challenging. So instead of you telling me you see the letter D or you see the letter T, I'd say when you, when you catch the ball, tell me a word that starts with that letter. So you would say Detroit or tree, you know? So you have to process through the task a little bit more. 
Yes. Uh, we could do geography games. We could do math games with the numbers. And that way you can meet everybody where they're at. You know, for kids that can't even sure. read yet, you can have them trace the letters and numbers and it starts to teach them that, that letter number recognition. Mm -hmm. We've seen some really beautiful work in, in preschools, having kids sit in a circle and they roll the ball to each other and then they stop it and they have to find something and then trace it. And then the teacher helps coordinate what it is and you know, telling a little more about the letter or number that they found and it gets the group kind of together in the education. Um, but it, it's the same thing with people that have suffered a stroke, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to play, play a game of catch and I'll even deflate the ball so they have an easier time catching it in case they have some pincer issues with their hands. So it's, it's just making it super simple because the brain loves better information. So just tapping into that. Yeah, no, that's really beautiful. And it's so multidimensional, multi-sensory. I can see where that would work for lots of different kinds of people you're working with, yeah, whether it's yeah. a kid or an adult or yeah, whatever their needs, whatever their needs are. So that's really, really brilliant. And if you're watching this on video and you can't see it, hold up the ball again. Sure, Trent, yeah. That was really cool. Um, he's got this beautiful ball. It's just, you know, it's just a yellow ball and it's got numbers and letters on it. So you can use it in a very multi-sensory way with kids like you described now. Yeah. That is that is that is brilliant. You know, so you really did track this all back to to the brain and are, are working. What's another activity that you might do with somebody after the ball activity, let's say? Yeah. So I want to incorporate movement. So playing a game of catch is like the simple way. And then mm -hmm. I want to incorporate movement with it. So you could take any exercise for me, I work in the, in the, in the field of Pilates. And so mm -hmm. I will incorporate the brain speed ball in a Pilates session. So you can actually incorporate the eye range of motion and the head movement into a physical exercise. So you have that proprioception input, you have the visual input, you have that vestibular input, you have that whole, what I call the whole brain approach. So yes. if you are a Pilates teacher, you can do that, but mm -hmm. also you could incorporate it into any kind of movement. We have teachers that teach yoga that incorporate it into their classes. Um, even if you don't teach yoga or you're not a teacher of a movement modality, you could do it before you get on a bicycle to ride to see the improvement in how you ride and make your technique better. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's really comes down to assessing what the person needs. So, you know, I might use some of our equipment that we have in the studio as well, but for me, I also want clients to have homework. I want a homework that they'll do homework that they enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it comes back to getting them the ball at home for them. And, and what about results? So give us an, a, like a case study, you know, give yeah. us a story of somebody that you've worked oh, yeah. with and you've watched the change in their body, their range of motion, everything, you know, it's yeah. all working. Um, yeah. I, I got a couple that are really inspiring to me. Um, one is a gentleman, he actually um, races motorcycles and he was on a, uh, a closed track going like 70, 60, 70 miles an hour and went a uh, 45 degree angle headfirst into a cement wall and suffered a, a massive traumatic brain injury, broke like 23 bones in his body. And, you know, he was in a coma for a while. Um, I knew his wife. Uh, mm -hmm. And so she had reached out to me saying, when I'm able to get him to you, I'd love you to work with him. And I'm like, whenever you're ready, I'm here. And so when she was able to bring him in, he had, he had just come out, off of using um, any kind of walking device just a few days prior. And so he, the way he described his walk um, in his words was that he walked like a drunk penguin. And, okay. and so okay. he had to, sort of that side to side wobble, holding on to the wall. He has a good sense of humor, holding on to the wall and um, very unstable feeling, just like mm -hmm. cannot get from here to there without feeling like he's going to fall over. And so uh, I was like, let's just see what can happen because I, I I'll, just as a side note, I never promise results, but I promise this. You're either going to get better, you're going to get worse, or you're going to stay the same. I promise. <laughs> because what I want to do is I want to keep this in an exploratory relationship, right? Not I have the answer. This is what you do, but more like, let's see how far we can go with this and let's see what we can get to happen. So I took that approach with them. Let's just see what we can have happen mm -hmm. here. And, and it'd be amazing if something magical happened. Well, we played a brain speed ball for about 10 minutes. I had him walk across the room again and he had no marked gait. He walked like nothing had ever happened to him. Oh, nice. Steady and stable. It was pretty amazing. And he was amazed. We were both just super emotional about it and just like, wow, this is incredible. And, you know, I found out that later on, you know, he went home and he was telling his family, like, look how I can walk. And all we did is play this game with this ball. And, 
they're like, that's nice, but let's see if you can still walk like that tomorrow. Let's see how long it lasts. Oh. And, and, and his, his drunk penguin never came back. He, ki- he kept his walk, he was able to go back to work full time as an engineer. And just he really is an incredible success story. Um, and certainly I was one part of it. He had a whole team. Mm-hmm. I'm not responsible for his full recovery, mind you. But, you know, being able to walk with some confidence is important. It really does affect your quality of life and being able to get back to work and back to the things. And he was young. So he has, you know, a very long career professionally in front of him to still accomplish. So it yeah. was amazing. Oh, that's part of that. brilliant. That's a beautiful yeah. story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and that's such testimony, not just to you, to your work, but also the, the brain how the brain can be changed. You know, we can change our brain patterns. You know, we can do that. Um, And you're proving that every day and working with people um, in all capacities with that. So that's awesome. That is really, really awesome. And you know what, when I think about how we, we don't really, if you have a good brain and you don't have an accident like that, you haven't suffered in any way, we kind of take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Right, we take it. We take it for granted. We don't even really realize. And yet, um, when you do have somebody that you love or somebody you care about have an accident like that, have a traumatic brain injury, and I don't know the statistics on this, but I know it's pretty high. You know, taking care of our taking care of our brains and and both eating right and getting movement exercise like you do with people before you have a problem is also important. Yeah, you know, yeah. is is also really really important. A lot of people have, have gaps and deficits that aren't really affecting their quality of life enough that they sense them. And then right. at some point they kind of accumulate enough. They're like, Oh, I don't have as good a balance as I used to all of a sudden. Well, it, it, very little is all of a sudden, a lot of it's like drip, drip, drip over time. Right. And then it's like, Oh, this is important now. And so they do something then, but it's been happening. It's been accumulating over time. And a lot of the people that we see you know, fall into what I call the movement gap. You know, there's this mm-hmm. place where people have an injury or they have something happen to them. They, they go th- through their, their medical uh, modalities. They finish their therapies, but they're not recovered. They're not better. They don't have their quality of life back. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of people that fall into that gap. And that's really the work that I do and the work that I supporting other teachers and professionals that are helping people that fall in that movement gap. And that's where I feel like, you know, the future of of support and wellness and health and in the world lives in helping people that have fallen into that movement gap. I like that. That's a really important point. Absolutely. In that movement gap. Yeah. 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 And I see that too, only I do it intuitively. I see, I see people who have had, um, you know, not just an injury necessarily, or, but maybe just even fatigue, you know, and fatigue comes still back to the, comes back to the brain and braid power. And then when we can like cross midline, you know, it's a lot of exercises and some of the processes integrations that I do are moving like this, like crossing midline, like making a figure eight in front of you. And even when I work with special ed, I was a special ed teacher for years, Trent. Um, you know, I remember working with a neurologist and he had kids who were maybe 18 years old that never crawled when they were little. Right. Yeah. And so they never crossed midline. And so they had to repattern the brain by doing those motions again. Yep. And it improved their reading, writing, and spelling and yeah. their school, their grades in school, and help them feel more confident in themselves too. And you yeah. are doing that as well. You're helping people gain that confidence. Look at this gentleman could walk and live his life and go back to being an engineer. Yeah. 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 Well, that, that you, what you really touched on is the other part of my own story that I'll share is that. Um, I failed first grade. I failed first grade because I had weak eyes. Now, Mm -hmm. I didn't know that's why. I didn't know until I was in my 30s that that was the reason because I wasn't able to read. Now, I could read and comprehend, but I couldn't read the speed or with the the skill that would be expected of me because I would just fall asleep when I would read. I would just like literally read a couple sentences and fall asleep. Wow. And so I, I, I developed the skill uh, in college of getting up at six or seven in the morning, standing up and doing my reading for my classes so that I wouldn't fall asleep to get through it. Wow. Uh, it took three times as much time, three times the amount of time to get through reading, but I did it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it wasn't until I was in my thirties that I had, I came across a vision therapist who discovered that my eyes didn't work very well together and they had a limited range of motion. 
And so that discovery is what really sparked my interest in bringing in this whole brain approach because I went through and did some eye exercises and my reading improved immediately. And I thought, wow, we need this in a way that everybody can access this. Not just if you, you qualify to go see a vision therapist, which is really, it's like, it's an important modality and it's important to professionals that we need, but most people aren't going to see a vision therapist. You know, mm -hmm. there's certain requirements before you would consider that because it's just like an obvious dysfunctional piece or a missing component or an injury or something. But most of us need stronger, more coordinated eyes and we would, we function better. We read better. And so when I, when I made that discovery and brought that in, um, I'll, I'll just tell you a funny story is that I, I was able to do audiobooks after college to read, right? Quote, read. Okay. I do audiobooks. Audiobooks. And so uh -huh. I would talk about the books that I was reading with my clients and with my friends and whatnot. But I knew in my mind there was a little shame around the fact that I wasn't reading them. I was uh -huh. listening to them, but I would call it reading. And so I was telling a client, uh, I was like, I'm, I'm reading this really great series. It's really for young adults, but I'm really enjoying it. And my daughter reads it. So I'm reading it with her. I was listening to the audio. And I said, Well, I'm on the next book. So I got to get the next book before my trip to California. And so the next time she came in, she brought me a copy of the next book in the series. And I was like, oh gosh. So now I have to download the audio, listen to the audio on my trip <laughs> and report back that I love the book. You know, all this whole, this whole show that I was going to put on. Right. And so I took the book with me knowing I wasn't going to read it, but I took it with me, felt obligated. It was kind of her. It was really sweet. Right. And then that trip is actually where I met this vision therapist. And I read the entire book on the plane when it coming home. And then I got oh, the rest of the cool. series. And I read the whole series and my wife was like, who are you? And what have you done with my husband? Because you don't read. <laughs> and, and it was this discovery that was just really sparked my curiosity and problem solving to bring this to life for, for people in a, a much more powerful way. And some of my favorite work that we've done is, is partnering with schools for the, with the PTO, we go mm -hmm. in and teach the parents and the teachers how to incorporate this work into the classroom. And you can watch the reading scores go up and the comprehension scores go up. It's just, it's incredible, you know, and it's simple and the teachers can do it. They don't have to be an expert to huh? play a game of catch, the, to coach the kids a little bit. It's, it's really inspiring. That's awesome. Oh, you're doing such great work with people. I mean, and I know we're talking a lot about the brain and, and everything today. How did, how did, you know, anything on your journey here or what you see with the people you work with, um, how does it affect your soul or your spirit? Yeah, you know, in, in different ways, you know, I'll, I'll tell you some of the challenges and some of the rewards, you know, it's people have um, some pretty significant things they're dealing with. You know, mm -hmm. there's a big traumas, you know, from your work, there's, there are people have gone through big traumas and movement can trigger their trauma. You can have a trauma response from movement they're doing or things that they're opening up. And, and so learning how to create a space and hold the space for someone who's dealing with a lot is, mm -hmm. was something that took me so, a while to kind of develop because, um, especially when I was younger, it wasn't something that we talked about. It wasn't something that was being discussed and, and, um, on the table for uh, developing how you would craft a session for someone, you know, just like here's, mm -hmm. here are the exercises, here's the modifications, here's how to be safe, here's the science behind it, here's the kinesiology, blah, blah, blah. But let's talk about the person. The person needs you to hold the space for them to feel safe right. so that they, they can take a risk, they can build a new pattern. Because if they're going to build a new pattern, they've got to feel safe. Otherwise, the brain is going to reject it. If they feel fear, if they get startled, if they have yeah. pain, it's not going to stick. So a lot of, a lot of the, the soul part is like watching someone feel more and more safety and then build trust mm -hmm. in the relationship and then watch them blossom and watch them accomplish things in their life that they couldn't do before. Oh, and that's it, beautiful. It, you know, one, one woman that I worked mm -hmm. with, you know, she was in her 50s. She was almost 60 years old and she couldn't cross the street on her own because she couldn't walk fast enough before the light changed. And she oh, would okay. have what you probably call a class three cerebral palsy. And so if there wasn't a parking spot on the side of the road where she had to go, she wouldn't be able to go to an appointment because she wouldn't be able to cross the street. So mm -hmm. she's missed job interviews and appointments because she couldn't get a parking spot that was, you know, within her capabilities. So, you know, I, I rarely do this, but I, I shot video of her on our first session. It's very unusual that I do that because I don't have the trust. And so I don't, I don't want to breach any kind of trust 
early sure. on, but somehow we were there. I shot video. So then I was able to shoot after video and measure how fast we had increased her gait speed, how fast she could now walk. And so she had a 500% increase in how fast she could walk. Oh, and nice. For the first time in her life, she could cross the street. So talk about soul. Talk about like, wow, this is incredible. Like her whole world has opened up to her now. She can park right. anywhere. She can walk across the street. It's pretty amazing. That's really awesome. I can tell you have that lot. Of, you have that heart too when you work with people, and that's what matters too. You know, I always think that love heals all. You know, so yeah. you know it's 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 kind of it's 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 part mechanics. You know, the tools that you've created, but it's that soul level piece. It's what yeah. you're bringing to those to those people on a daily basis, and you had to bring that to yourself first. Right. Right. And, so you got to heal yourself first yeah. and now you can help. And you have been, you know, for 20 years, you're helping others. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think when I work with other professionals, other movement professionals, it's helping them recognize that their experience and their value in, in how they're showing up in the world and recovering their own bodies and how they're helping clients, like really puts them in a very special place. Because, you know, if, you, if you've gone through something and you have then used that to inform how you help other people you know what people feel like, you know, not exactly because they have their own life experiences, but you, you know what it's like yes. to not be able to do something you used to be able to do or having a quality in, of your life that's really affected that you just can't seem to break. And then you know that. So then you become the person that helps open that world up for someone else. And it's just a beautiful relationship that happens. It is a beautiful, and you know, that's what entrepreneurs do. They take their, take their, their pain points or whatever happened in their lives. And usually they often create some kind of passion project from it. Um, yeah. And then they do this great work in the world like you're doing. Um, and you're affecting so much change for so many people. I know you're in, your clinic is in Michigan, right? Rochester, yeah. Michigan. Yes. So, but do you work with people all over too? Do Yeah, you? I do. I work with people online and I, I develop some online programs for people so that, you know, they have really easy, affordable ways to get a hold of the content to, mm -hmm. to move because ultimately, you know, I, I recognized early on in my career that I, I can't help everybody. Like I literally, I can work all day, every day and affect a tiny, tiny fraction of the people that really need the support. So mm -hmm. I made a commitment early in my career to find ways to make this accessible by both teaching other professionals so I could expand who's helping people and build mm -hmm. out that network but also create programs and things that people could do that are within reach and very easy. You don't have to have a big education. You don't have to understand the brain at all. You don't have to have a science background. You can just play a game and mm -hmm. it works for you. And it's, it's pretty, it's important to me to make it accessible. Yeah, that's great. The more people you're touching, the better. I'm going to turn the tables here a little bit, get to know you kind of personally, you sure. know, so when you're not at work and you're not helping people, what does Trent like to like to do in his free time? What's so, I, I mean, family time is important to me. So I do spend a lot of time with my family. I have a, a, my oldest daughter's in college. She's a junior in college. And my youngest just had her last day of high school today. And wow. so we, we have, uh, we're busy preparing for an open house coming up. But personally, one of my favorite things to do is mountain bike. So I'm a, a pretty passionate mountain biker. Um, I've been in a bike my whole life. Mountain biking is about a year and a half for me to being on a trail. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, if I've got free time, then I'm on the trail. <laughs> You're on the trail. Are there trails yeah. where you are in Michigan? Oh yeah. We have some of the best trails. We, you know, it's, it's, we have a ton of forest and a ton of really, really well taken care of trails that for all levels. And I, I find oftentimes some of the, my best work and ideas come from applying the challenges on the trail to the work that I'm doing, because oh. when you're on a trail, you have a terrain that is different from one week to the next. It rains you know, and the wind blows and it changes the trail. And so sure. you're never on the same trail twice, really. And you might be familiar with the twists and turns, but it changes all the time. So you're constantly problem solving. So there's so many odd times where I'm on the trail problem solving, like the next 10 yards, the next 10 yards, the next 10 yards as they're coming to me, that it's very similar to when I'm working with somebody. They're very similar to even when I'm working on my own, on my own body and my own brain, is I'm, I have to address what's happening now. What's right in front of me right now is not the same as what it was yesterday you know, it's living and breathing. So it's amazing that I find those correlations because it wasn't the purpose of me doing it. I, I do it for my own enjoyment. I, I love overcoming the challenge of it. I love mm -hmm. the idea of accomplishing and writing. Sometimes I'm writing for two, three, four hours, you know, doing a lot of miles and really hard terrain. And there's a lot of personal accomplishment that comes from being able to do that. 
and having being, you know, blessed enough in my body to be able to accomplish that, especially with everything that I've gone through and all, all the things that I've experienced yeah. in my body. That's beautiful. Wow. And that's a long mo- mountain bike ride. Yeah, I don't yeah. think I, I don't think I can queue up. Yeah, you're welcome to come to Albuquerque. We've got amazing trails here too, but they're a lot of bumpy and hilly and you know, yeah. all the different kinds. And there's rocks in the road and it's just all yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds fun. And it's all really, really, really different. That's that's wonderful. You know, well, who are some of your early mentors? You know, who helped you learn what you know now? Yeah, I mean it's no no names you'd recognize. Okay. But I'll tell you my my professors in college, I, I was just so lucky to have professors in college that while they were teaching dance, they had a lot of passion around movement recovery. And so early on, you were talking about the Bartenia fundamentals and Laban movement analysis, yes, um, kinesiology. Like you don't have to know how to pronounce them to know what I'm going to tell you that that these modalities are movement recovery, Feldenkrais, movement recovery modalities. Okay. And they, they were so informative in how I decided to pursue patterning because they're all about patterning the body and patterning the brain and, mm-hmm. and movement. Um, but they don't make you stronger. Physically, you don't get stronger doing them. And so my curiosity was like, well, how can we take these modalities that are so fantastic in brain patterning, but make you physically stronger at the same time. And that's really where my work came is like bringing those worlds together. Um, but my, my professors, they opened those doors for me. They said like, you know, here are these modalities. And certainly, you know, people work just in those modalities, but my curiosity was actually at a higher level and looking for even more leadership for myself and leadership for others to bring this work into uh, a, a way that could help other people. Like they helped me you know? Yes. And you know what I love about what you're saying here too, Trent, not only are we learning what you do and, um, you know, the the miracles you're helping create for people, you have such great questions. You're questioning yourself all the time. You're asking good questions. It's the power of the questions. You know, my teacher said to me, Hey, the question's more important than the answer. And when you ask the question, it's kind of like you already are implying the answer but it's helping the process of that brain go through those questions so you can get to the the bottom line root causes of things too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. asking better questions. It's like, if you're stuck, ask a better question. And then ask ask a better question. (laughs) That's great advice. I'm gonna remember that one. You guys remember that one if you're listening. Ask a better question. Love that, love that. That's beautiful. Well, you know, you started this business, you know, it started out with you just healing yourself. Do you have any advice for anybody else who might be looking at starting any kind of, you know, any kind of business, whether it's something to do with the brain or movement or anything? Um, as they're just beginning, what would what advice would you give? To them. I would I would follow your intuition okay. and and trust your own experiences. You know that's when I started I was really young and I mm-hmm. I was looked at for many years like yeah you're too young to know anything you're too young to know anything and all of a sudden like I turned the page and it was like I was old enough for them to pay attention. I've been telling them the same thing for 15 <laughs> years but somehow <laughs> something happened. I was old enough to know enough. So when I was 21, they're like, yeah, yeah, you're not old enough. You don't have enough life experience. And I'm like, well, actually, I've got 21 years of having a brain injury and the result of that. And I actually have a lot to bring to the table. So I was sort of a really unique species. Um, you know? <laughs> and I think that if, no matter what your age is, is just trusting the intuition and mm-hmm. asking good questions and, and unfolding it and just seeing where it takes you and, and follow, go where it takes you. Mm-hmm. And certainly when I started, I would have never thought that I would have been manufacturing a ball you know I wouldn't even it would have never crossed my mind to do that but it was just following the path that was a part of my story and I think for me if, if you're if you're starting a, a, an organization you're starting a method or something if it's connected to your story then it's just like write that story down and keep writing and keep writing and keep writing and and if you're not a writer what I did is I, I worked with a writer and I just told my story so that he could write it and put it together for me mm-hmm. in a way that other people could really grasp it. Because when you look at the story and you look at the trajectory of the, the work I've done in my business, they're, they're completely a match. And so if mm-hmm. we're going to have a conversation about any of the work, it's my life. It's not just this product that I invented that's not related to my own life. It's everything right. is so intertwined. And so if that's who you are, if, 
if that's how you're showing up with your business, then really consider being so vulnerable to share your stories. You know, failing first grade was Mm -hmm. a shame to share. I failed first grade. Who fails first grade? Well, I failed first grade. It was the best thing that could have happened to me. The absolute best thing that could have happened because it was the start of something that has become bigger than I could I ever imagine. And, and, and as I continue to build out my vision to get more people, more access to this work, it just, to me, it proves that following that intuition is where it's at. Oh, that's beautiful. Thanks for that. You know, we just had that earlier today too. I asked the same question um, and it was about intuition. Mm. So I just want to share all that with your, our listeners here that yes, follow your intuition, follow your heart like Trent did here. Uh, you never know where it's going to, where it's going to go. Um, if you were going to give us your number one, besides your beautiful ball and everything you shared with us here, if you had one brain hack that you could share with us today, um, what would that be? Well, I would, I would just reinforce that the eyes are the, the fastest way to talk to your brain. And so if you're stressed, uh-huh. if you're feeling pain, if you can't sleep, if you can't regulate, that just doing some simple eye range of motion, you could even follow your pencil back and forth, up and down if you don't have a ball, just to get the eyes to track and to focus mm-hmm. on something and to strengthen the musculature of the eyes is really important. And you can do that anywhere, at your desk, before you go to bed. Just don't underestimate how powerful the eyes are over your whole system. Oh, wow, great brain hack. Wow. Learned so much today from you. This has just been amazing. Thank you for the beautiful work that you're doing in the world. How can people get a hold of you, Trent? You know, if they're listening today and they say, hey, I need this, or I have a, my neighbor needs some help, you know, or, or yeah. whatever, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, there's two things I'll tell you. The first is I would invite you to go to fireupyourbrain.com. Mm-hmm. So at fireupyourbrain.com, there's uh, more about the programs we have for kids, for seniors, and for athletes that are online programs and they come with a ball and it can get you started in that direction. If you want to learn more about, you know, my bigger vision for how I want to help more people come out of the movement gap, you can go to the movementgap.com and read more about that. And a lot of our, uh, the work that's ex- described there expresses the numbers how many millions of people and with their conditions and what they're dealing with. So it can kind of fill in the picture for you there as well. Yes. You were, you were said you had a story for us, Trent. Yeah. Yes. You, you had asked, you know, who, who inspired me early on in my work. And you know what? what? I want to what? share someone who inspired me. It wasn't in my work. It was before my work really started. And that was when I was in fifth grade. Okay. Um, Mr. Berlinski and Mr. Berlinski had the idea of bringing in a student from the special ed class, because at that point they had they were they were in their own classroom. They weren't integrated into the school, right? So, uh-huh. so they said, you know, can I get a volunteer that would sit next to this student during social studies? And I was the only one that raised my hand. Classroom of twenty five kids, and I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And you know, it was like nobody wanted to do this. And so the young man came in. He pushed our desks together. And I was in charge of making sure he was on track with his reading, which is hysterical because of how hard reading was for me. But I was, I was tr- you know, helping him stay on track with what paragraph we were on and, and making sure he knew what the assignment was. And you know, essentially, the work was helping him, what they would call integrate into the classroom and integrate right. into normal, I hate that, but like normal life, right? At, sure. that, at that stage in, the, in development in special ed. Um, and that really stuck with me because what he was asking for was somebody to be a leader, to be courageous to do something that had never been done in that school, Mm -hmm. to stand out and be different, to Mm -hmm. be seen as other among kids that were all going to conform and not raise their hand and see what could happen. And it really is the model for my 25-year career. That's what I've done. That's what I continue to do. And I think Mr. Berlinski's idea he has no idea the impact that that had on me. And early on, the get, having that be a part of my patterning for an entire year, it was natural. Like, yeah, that's what I do. I just, you know, partner with people that need that gap filled in and help them fill it in. And help them Everybody fill doesn't in. do that. It just seems natural to me. And I think I can trace it all the way back to that moment when he asked for a volunteer. That is a one that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what we do as kids, sometimes we grow up to be, 
Yeah. You know, yeah. I always tell the story how I, we played school and we played spy. So the treehouse <laughs> was our headquarters. And I think we were like six, six and seven years old. Like we were little kids, right? My right. best friend, Susie and I. And so I became a teacher and she became a cop. So I say, hey, well, watch what your kids do when they're right. Watch what your kids do when they're little. And you clearly had such a great fifth grade teacher and an opportunity yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing with us. Um, and again, till next time, everyone, follow your heart, but take your brain with you. And we'll see you next time. Have a good one, everyone.